Who was ultimately in charge of England? Prime Minister. Minister. No. The Queen. The Queen. You know, you have the Queen, but then you have a Prime Minister. So really, the Prime Minister is really just second in command under the King. So in the Davidic Kingdom, all these kings, they were the ultimate ruler. They were the ultimate king. But underneath the king, there was a person who was called the prime minister. And he was delegated with having authority, the, the king's authority. Naturally, the king had the ultimate authority, but the prime minister was second in command. Well, this is what they had in the Davidic kingdom. All the kings had this, David, Solomon, all the way down the line. So let's see what happens here. Now the Lord God goes to an official, Shebna. This guy named Shebna. And he was an official. He was a prime minister. Underneath the king. And then he, this guy did some stupid stuff, okay? And then in verse 19, through the prophet Isaiah, God says, I'm going to thrust you from your office. office. Again, what's an office? Does it end when a person dies? No. So this prime minister is in office, just like, you, just like you know, bishops. So he's going to take this guy out of the office. And on that day now, he's going to replace this person, the guy named Eliakim, okay? And get this, I'm going to clothe him with your robe. See if this sounds like anything familiar. He's going to clothe this person with a robe. He's going to gird him with a, with a sash. And we'll give him, and we'll give over to him your authority. And he'll be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Does that kind of sound like anything? Like the Pope. Does it kind of sound like a pope? Yeah. Kind of sounds like a pope, doesn't it? Okay. And now, I will place the key. Do you get the word here? I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. This is what they did back then. The prime minister got a key from the king symbolizing that you are second in command. So this key now represents that the prime minister was second in command underneath the king. Got that? That's Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, who is the king? Christ. And using Augustine's quote now, the old now is revealed in the new, Christ is now the king when he tells Peter, Peter, I'm giving you the keys. What's he doing? Putting him in charge. He's doing the same thing here. He's giving Peter the keys. And what do the keys represent? The office. An office which gives authority. So just like here in the Old Testament times, the prime minister was second in command. Yeah. The New Testament times, who's ultimately in command? Right. Christ. But now he's given Peter, yes. Peter, your second in authority. That's what the keys are all about in Matthew 16. It's given Peter the authority. You are second in command. Not first, but second. So don't let anyone tell you we worship the Pope and we think Pope is Christ. Oh, we know better than that. <laughs> he's second in command. He's his representative on earth. But ultimately, the king is Christ. And again, it's an office. If Christ is the king, and if this is an office, what happens when Peter dies? Does it go away? No. It's an office. It's filled just like the presidency. And you know what I'm talking about here. This is where we get the papacy. Right there. The keys. Interesting they use the word minister, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know how much... I don't know how, you know how simple it can be, but that's it. Well, it's always simple when you have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> With that, let's take a break. You gotta know what question it is. Peter, upon you, I'll build my church, so I give you the keys. And if you go back to Isaiah 22, it gives us the reference what the keys are all about. Authority. Uh -huh. But is that it? No. Or is there more in the Bible that tells us that Christ did give authority to Peter.
Must be Luke. Let's take a look at Luke's gospel. There's more that tell us. And folks, in the scripture, it's incredible how much proof there is in the Bible that Peter was indeed the head apostle. There's so much in the Bible. So let's look at another one. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, 31 through 32. Remember that Satan has asked for you. Whosoever you are, I have we marked. <laughs> and I have prayed for you that your faith may never fail. You in turn must strengthen your brothers. Lord, he said to them, at your side I am prepared to face imprisonment and death itself. Okay. Okay. Was that the right one? Yes. 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 Sure. So Simon, Jesus is telling Peter, you know, Simon, Peter, same guy. Satan has demanded to shift all, sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter. Christ is telling Peter, I'm praying for you so that your faith will not fail. And once you have turned back, you know, good old Pete, what did he do when the cock crowed three times? What did he do? He denied Christ. But Christ is here. Once you've turned back, Peter, you must strengthen your brothers. Who do you think the brothers are here? Peter, you must strengthen your brothers. The believers. The other apostles. Christ is praying for Peter specifically. Once you come back, Peter... You must strengthen your brothers. Speaking of the apostles. Okay. And how about this one here? This one is absolutely incredible. And you've heard this one before. John chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. We've heard this one before, right? How many times has Peter, uh, Christ asked Peter the question? Three times. Three times. What do you think that might be a reference to? Denied him three, Denied him three, Denied him three yes. times? Took me three times to get it right last time. So, again, three times. And did he catch every time what Jesus said? Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now let's put it in perspective, going back a little bit. And remember, this is after Jesus rose from the dead, in context, when he's told Peter this. He's ready to ascend to heaven. But prior to this, you know, we're talking about sheep and lambs. What's he referring to here? His flock. His flock. His flock. And who is the good shepherd? Christ, right? Throughout the, the New Testament times, Christ is the good shepherd. He shepherds his flock of sheep. And now in context here, Christ is ready to ascend from he to heaven. At this point in the gospel, he's already risen from the dead. And now he goes to Peter. And now he says, Peter, you feed my sheep. A question. What do you mean by the verse, do you love me more than these? Who are the these? Probably the other apostles. Do you love me more than, or do you love me more than anything more than else? Fish. I'm sorry, huh? More than a fish. More than a fish, yeah. Do you love me more than anything else? <laughs> but then he's saying, yeah, then he's saying, I'm the shepherd now, but now, Peter, I want you to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. What's he now making Peter? In charge. In charge of the sheep. Mm -hmm. He's making Peter now the shepherd. Why do you think Christ is doing that? Neither one central authority. He's going to ascend to heaven. He's not going to be on earth anymore. So now he's saying, Peter, I give you the keys now. I've prayed for you. Now I'm giving you the flock. You're going to be now the shepherd. You are going to be my shepherd on earth of my flock. 